It is now my pleasure to introduce a colleague of mine, uh, the President of the Australian Local Government Association, Dr Felicity Ann Lewis, and also the Mayor of the City of Marion in South Australia. Felicity was named as South Australia's Australian of the Year for 2014, and Felicity is best known outside of her state for her tireless campaigning and lobbying on behalf of local government and community issues across Australia. The State Award also recognised her substantial contribution to the reconciliation movement and the settlement of migrants and refugees throughout the nation. Felicity has served as Mayor of Marion for almost 14 years, which is a mighty achievement in itself, and was also the leader of the South Australian Local Government Association prior to her election as the Olga President. So please welcome Felicity. Thank you, um, Bill, for that warm welcome and good morning. And I must say, in regards to the award, I was absolutely staggered at how many people from across Australia and local government felt somehow lifted by the fact that someone from local government had actually been acknowledged uh, in those awards. I think uh, often we don't really look for acknowledgement, but um, people did say that it made them feel affirmed. And, uh, and so I hope that uh, you might feel some of that um, and acknowledge that uh, people out there in the community do really value what you do. So, good morning everybody. I want to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and uh, thank them for their continuing care and relationship with their country and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I see a familiar face. Hello Anne, how did, how did you get in here? Didn't they check your passport carefully? Oh, okay. Great, well there you go, wonderful. So is there anyone else from out of town other than in Victoria? Oh yeah, okay, good, oh well. Lovely to have you, I'm sure the man is very happy to see you here. Now, I know we're on a tight time frame, so I'll try and get through, and I did, did get to hear a little bit of that last presentation, so um, I hope that uh, what, um, what you hear now to give you that national perspective um, will link in somehow to, to what you've been talking and listening to just before. Um, my topic is very wide, the challenges facing local government, and it calls for a grand sweep across a number of issues. But I'm glad to see that you've not spared our friend Jeff Kennett, who follows me, and he gets the title for his presentation of What Future Local Government? At least my topic only involves a good knowledge and insight about the present, whereas Jeff's requires the ability to see into the future, so I look forward to his prophecies. Now, as you know, there are about 560 councils in Australia, and they're all unique, and whilst that might be our strength, perhaps the last presentation suggested that was a weakness as well providing services and infrastructure to widely different communities. Local government areas differ in geography and population, and there are significant differences between the state and territories, and they all face different challenges. I've therefore decided to look at the major nationwide challenges facing local government, looking at them through the prism of the policy of the new federal government and what we know of its policies and initiatives. I intend to address local government's role in the federation and the funding of local government, including taxation reform and the forthcoming white paper on taxation. And while I was travelling this morning, and I've just seen it on my iPad, um, I noticed that John Brumby gave an oration of some sort last night, I can't exactly remember what it was, and local government wasn't mentioned. He talked about federation. So we've got a few challenges if we've got commentators like John out there who, when talking about um, the Federation don't even mention us. I'll then go on and cover local government's place in the national agenda, including productivity, infrastructure, the environment, human services and natural disasters. At the end of it, I think we'll have a reasonable grasp on the challenges we face and hopefully time for a question or two. Let me again acknowledge the President, uh, your, the presence of your President, Councillor Bill MacArthur, ALGA is a federation of state and territory local government associations and Bill is one of the MAPS directors on the ALGA board. The other one is Councillor Mary Lalios of Woodlesea Council and I want to thank them for their contribution uh, to the board and uh, when we meet it's always good to catch up with them and hear their views. Having dealt with our own federation, 
ALBA, let me now turn to the other federation, the Australian Federation. Now, there's a widespread view that the Australian Federation can work better. According to the Australian Constitutional Value Survey of 2012, the Australian public is generally supportive of a federal structure of government, does not believe our federation is functioning as well as it could be. Around two thirds of Australians do not believe governments work well together and believe the federation needs reform. Now, this is a view obviously shared by the Prime Minister who has announced a white paper process on the federation. Now, I understand there will be an issues paper released for comment later this year and a green paper prepared in the first half of 2015 and then a white paper settled by the end of 2015. So this may provide an idea for reform which the Prime Minister takes to the next election, presuming that's in 2016. The challenge for local government is to be engaged in this process and to influence its outcomes so that local government plays an important part in any new federal model. Now, COAG met on the 2nd of May and considered the issue, and I'm pleased to say that it agreed to establish a steering committee chaired by the Commonwealth and involving all the states and territories and ALGA to oversee the development of the Federation White Paper. And let me tell you, I had to work very hard on schmoozing the Prime Minister on that one because he told me at his first COAG that, no, you're a nice lady, Felicity Ann, but you're not in it. So we've moved quite a long way from that conversation. ALGA has argued that the Federation White Paper process should not be a search for a perfect federal model with the Constitution being the only source material. We need a review which looks at how the Federation actually works in the real world, how the different levels of government, including local government, work together now and can work together better in the future. All three levels of government serve the same people and they don't care which level of government does what, as I think was suggested by the earlier speaker. They just want to see services and infrastructure provided in the most efficient and equitable way possible. So where does that, where does that leave local government in the Constitution? Well, you'll all know the push for a referendum fell at the last hurdle in 2015. The constitutional change we saw was a narrow one the change to Section 96 to confirm the capacity of the Commonwealth to directly fund local government. The referendum could only take place on or after the 14th of September because of the legislative timetable adopted by the previous government. When the election was brought forward by a week, the referendum could not go ahead. We'll never know whether it would have been successful. We at ALGA were confident it would have got up. That's immaterial. The fact is, the constitution was not changed and the new government is now going to put the not going to put the referendum forward. Of course, the threat to the direct funding we receive from the federal government has not gone away. The doubts raised in the High Court in the Pape and Williams cases not only remain, but are back in the High Court again with the second Williams case. That case came up before the High Court two weeks ago with Mr Williams renewing his challenge to the school chaplains program and the Commonwealth's legislative fix in response to the first case. There probably won't be a decision for several months and commentators expect the chaplaincy program to be struck down again. But if you want to know how hardball the Commonwealth plays in this area, it's worth noting that the budget papers last week provided $240 million over five years to continue the chaplaincy program. So there's still a problem, but we'll have to wait and see how this plays out. The Abbott government has said it is committed to protecting the direct funding it provides to councils through programs such as Roads to Recovery. The Federation White Paper is not an avenue to seek constitutional recognition, but it is an opportunity to get acknowledgement of the fact that local government does play a role in the Federation and should continue to play a role. Now that is our challenge and you all have to play your part as council by making submissions to the white paper process when the time arises. There are other models of how the Federation should work being touted at present. The National Commission of Audit released its report just before the budget and it recommends that the Commonwealth should play no role in local government funding. Not just direct funding, 
but no financial assistance grants. The grants would end, but the Commonwealth would pass some taxing power to the states to raise the money, which they would then pass to local government. Sounds like a good plan. The same goes for health, education, infrastructure, and lots of other things the Commonwealth does. In fact, the Commission says the Commonwealth should give back most of the things it does which people value, and for which the Commonwealth takes a lot of credit. So, no responsibility, but no glory either. So it's hard to see what your local federal MP would do if there were no road projects, no bridge projects, no other community infrastructure projects, and no grants to the community and to community groups. In fact, very little at all for them to get credit for, except perhaps the occasional flight pass by the Air Force. We don't, that's a joke, we don't support the Commission of Audit recommendations and the next ALGA National General Assembly in Canberra on the 15th to the 18th of June will give attending councils the chance to make their views known too. If you haven't planned to come, please do so. The stronger the voice we have, the more likely it is to be heard by the federal government. Now let's turn to the funding question in more detail. The challenge local government as a whole faces is one of financial sustainability. That will come as no surprise to all of you. As councils, we can and should seek to be as efficient as we can in delivering services and infrastructure. That's not, not going to be enough to overcome our funding gap. The Price Waterhouse Coopers Report of 2006 put the infrastructure backlog at $14.6 billion, which was only $14.6 billion nationally, and stated that the backlog was a product of councils with limited revenue bases, concentrating on growing demands for recurrent services and not addressing that backlog. Well, the demand for services are going to keep growing, but our revenue is going to remain under pressure. Many smaller councils do not have the option to increase rates. Their rates bases are just too low. Other councils in major metropolitan areas have more capacity to look at rates increases, but even they recognise that there are growing questions about ability to pay in ageing communities as asset-rich homeowners retire and increasingly become income poor. We need to look at the match between taxation and service provision. At the aggregate level, local government raises a little over 40% of their revenue from rates. Many councils, of course, raise much more from rates. Others raise virtually nothing from rates because they have little or no rateable land. We must fight to protect our rate base. The Henry Report into tax reform identified rates and all types of land tax as a very efficient tax which should be exploited <coughs> to the full. Unfortunately, the states collect two thirds of the land tax, we get the rest. And yet there are increasing demands from the other levels of government that local government rates be used to collect levies such as emergency services levies or environmental levies or suggestions they may be used to fund national programs such as the new National Injury Insurance Scheme expected to begin in 2017. We must be united in opposing these approaches. Our local ratepayers expect to see local services and infrastructure delivered by councils in return for the rates that they pay. And this is a point we must push strongly in the forthcoming taxation white paper foreshadowed over the next two years. We must also push to maintain and restore the level of general revenue support we get from the Commonwealth through the financial assistance grants. The Commonwealth's decision to freeze indexation for three years from next year will deprive councils of a cumulative total of $925 million, almost a billion dollars, in fags by 2017-18. But in that last year, the value of the grants received by local government will be $321 million less than it would otherwise have been. By the following year, 2018-19, the base will probably be around $335 million less. By the year after that, it will be about $350 million less. So that, colleagues, is the entire value of the Roads to Recovery program. We fought to keep the R2R program and instead, the government will be taking the full value of the program away from our core funding. We must fight to have the indexation freeze reversed. Again, I urge you to come to the NGA in June to support our cause directly. 
Now, I've dealt with the two big issues, so let me now turn to the national policy agenda outlined by the other government and the challenges it presents for local government. First, the government has highlighted the need to improve productivity, in part through deregulation and infrastructure investment. For local government, the challenge for us on the issue of deregulation is to look at our regulatory roles and make sure they are done as efficiently as possible. Of course, councils often undertake regulatory functions on behalf of the state governments. And as the Productivity Commission found in its reporting to local government as a regulator in 2012, councils are typically provided with inadequate resources, guidance or training by state governments in undertaking those regulatory functions. We have to highlight this point as part of the debate. Now, that's not to say that council cannot undertake regulation more efficiently. The Productivity Commission report highlights some best practice examples of good risk-based regulation, and I recommend you to look at them. But at the end of the day, we need to make sure that the goal of deregulation is about getting the right level of regulation, not just less regulation for its own sake. We have regulations for clear public policy reasons of health, safety and avoidance of nuisance. Any deregulation must not impact on the outcomes that regulation must achieve. Now, there are going to be two main issues of deregulation relevant to us. A focus on housing approvals and small business regulation, such as cafes. Now, here in Victoria, the focus will be on exporters and food manufacturing. ALGA will be seeking to emphasise that deregulation must mean better regulation, not poorer regulation. On infrastructure investment, the focus is on the amount of investment and the efficiency of procurement. Local government has a pretty good track record on procurement, especially when compared with major state government projects which are plagued by cost blowouts. On the amount of investment, however, we face difficulties in the area of community infrastructure, with the infrastructure renewals gap revealed by PricewaterhouseCoopers not likely to decrease. The regional and, regional and local community infrastructure program under the previous government was highly successful, but it should be permanent at around $350 million per annum if we're to get ahead of the challenge. The Regional Development Australia Fund was of some help, but it has been terminated and replaced with a stronger regions fund starting in 2015-16. We can expect that the program will have some focus on community infrastructure, but at only $200 million per year will not be enough and will likely be restricted to a few disadvantaged regions. On the area of transport infrastructure, roads remain the biggest challenge that we have. And while the R2R program has been maintained to 2018-19, as we've just seen, the councils will lose almost the same amount of funding from the fags. Now, there's a Bridges Renewal Program starting next year, but it's relatively small, only $60 million per annum. And we will have to compete with the state governments for those funds. Now, there are some positive developments on the issue of heavy vehicles and the prospect that reform on charging and investment over the next five years or so will lead to local councils getting a share of the taxes paid by heavy vehicle operators given that local roads are used by these vehicles and the councils currently get nothing. But this area is far from settled, and the most recent reforms, the implementation of the new heavy vehicle national law and the establishment of the national heavy vehicle regulator were fraught with problems and served to highlight that many heavy vehicle trips on local roads occur without the council's management or agreement or even knowledge. As road owners and managers, councils must be able to manage their assets and obtain a fair revenue stream. If industry expects us to be able to use roads in a responsible fashion and if we're to overcome the so-called first and last mile access problems. Let me now turn to the environment. At the national level, the agenda seems to have two main focuses creating a one-stop shop to streamline the way the Federal Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act is administered, and the introduction of the Direct Action Plan to address climate change. On the EPBC Act, councils like the states need greater certainty around the Commonwealth's role in approvals, and sensible regulatory reform is a good thing. We do need to be wary, however, of a reform being used as a Trojan horse to centralise all decision-making power for project approvals of all sorts in the hands of the state governments, 
without mechanisms to ensure that community <coughs> concerns are addressed. <coughs> the direct action plan for climate change is being implemented as we speak and there is draft legislation available for comment by the 23rd of May. So I hope you've all got on to that. The primary concerns for councils are whether the emissions reduction activities undertaken by local government will qualify for support under the Emissions Reduction Fund. While many of our activities may be high quality, reducing emissions in the long run, there are many commercial entities which have done little to reduce emissions and which will stand to benefit the most. The danger we face is that the program will not engage the community and general support across the community for emissions reduction behaviour at the individual level and the council level will be lost. Community coherence is a fragile thing and we must work hard to maintain it. The strength of our communities at the broader level is also a challenge for councils in, the terms of the, in terms of the human services they deliver. Services to the young, the aged, multicultural groups, etc. Preventative health services and settlement services, just to mention a few. The challenge for councils will remain a recognition that providing any such services must be balanced with meeting core obligations in the areas of infrastructure, roads and bridges and stormwater infrastructure. We cannot make up for what state government should do, but do not do. Importantly, the need to make hard decisions has just become more difficult as the federal government cuts local government funding and cuts to funding for benefits affecting the most disadvantaged in the community. They may turn to local government for help, but our own capacity will be less. Finally, let me turn to natural disasters. Victoria, like Queensland, has been severely affected by natural disasters in recent years. The push at the national level by the federal government is to review the funding provided to manage natural disasters. The Productivity Commission has been tasked with undertaking a review and has released an issues paper and called for submissions by the 4th of June. I urge Victorian councils to make submissions to the review. <coughs> Now, ALGA has long pushed for a change in disaster funding so that more is spent on mitigation in an effort to reduce the impact of disasters. There is much that councils do in the area of disaster mitigation already, but so much more could be done if the federal government invested in mitigation in partnership with local government. Ten years ago, the federal government had a dedica dedicated mitigation program in partnership with the other levels of government, but today that program, the Natural Disaster Mitigation Program, is gone. There is some light on the horizon with the government reintroducing a bushfire mitigation program funded for three years at $5 million per year. But we need much more. Remarkably, it's in the Commonwealth's interest to fund this mitigation since it ends up picking up most of the costs of relief and recovery through the Natural Disaster Relief and Recovery Arrangements, so you'd think that they would jump at the chance to invest upfront in mitigation. The challenge for councils in the states, however, is that the Commonwealth may be thinking of limiting or ending the NDRRA and deciding that disaster costs are the responsibility of the states and that they must fund more of the costs of recovery and relief from their own sources. That is what the Commission of Audit seemed to be recommending in this area. So I hope you'll join ALGA in facing this challenge through the Productivity Commission process. In conclusion, I've painted a sketch of some of the major challenges local government faces at the national level. There are no easy answers, and the questions we face in the next few years through the various white paper processes go to the heart of how the Federation and the tax systems work and local government's place in them. We all face a very challenging time and ALBA will be doing its best to protect and advance the interests of local government and the communities we serve. But we can't do it without you. Thank you.